Okay, well, I'll start um, then. So last time I introduced the course. Today I want to start by looking at some simple ways of measuring temperature. Okay. Thermodynamics is all based upon the description of how systems change when their temperature changes. So the first thing you need to be able to do is to measure temperature. So that's going to be the topic for today. Okay, so if you want to measure temperature, you need to find some way in which it affects a physical property of a system, and then by measuring the change in whatever property, you can infer a change in temperature. So I'm going to talk about three different kinds of properties, three different effects of temperature, and then for each of those, I'm going to describe a different way in which you can measure temperature. So the first one of these is probably the simplest, and it's what's known as the linear expansion of solids. If you suppose that I take some solid, let's say it's a block of metal, which has a certain length, you can write as L, and it's got a certain temperature, which I can call T, then what happens if we heat it, and not for all, but for, m sorry, not for all, but for most solids, you find that if you heat it, it will expand. Okay, so if you heat the solid, you find that the length will increase. So if I go to a higher temperature, say T plus delta T, where delta T is a small change in the temperature, you will find that the length of the block has increased. by this small amount, which we can call L plus delta L, the change in length. So this is called the thermal expansion, linear thermal expansion of solids. If you heat something, its length would increase, usually. It's not true for everything. Now we can define a physical property of whatever these substances, metal or whatever, which determines how much will the length change when we increase the temperature. And this is called the coefficient of thermal expansion. The linear expansion coefficient. Okay, this I'm going to give the symbol alpha, and it's defined as equal to the change in length as I change the temperature divided by the total length of the substance. Okay, obviously, obviously if I've got something twice as long, I would expect it to extend twice as much. So that's why we divide by the total length here. So it's the proportional change in length. Um, then for most substances, this is approximately constant, although it does change with temperature. So for example, at room temperature, I looked up some values. Two different types of metals, brass and steel. Brass has a linear expansion coefficient of 1.9 times 10 to the minus 5 per change in degree. <coughs> and for steel, it's 1.1 times 10 to the minus 5 per change in degree. So you can see that these are quite small effects, 10 to the minus 5, so it's about 0.002%. So it's a very small effect, but you can measure it. So that's the first way in which 
um, changing temperature can affect the properties of solids. A second way is very related to this. It, therefore, if I heat something, its volume will also increase. Okay. But we can also define this volume expansion for fluids as well as solids. This is a volume expansion, and this we can define for solids and fluids. Fluids includes liquids and gases, so all states of matter. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, I take a given volume of some substance, let's suppose it's a gas, I've got a box. So this is a gas at, at temperature T, and the volume is V. Now we want to allow it to expand, okay? because obviously we want to measure the change in volume. So we allow it to expand by making one side of the box, let's say the top, movable. So this top can move up and down, but we apply a constant force to it. So we push down on the gas with a constant force, but if the pressure in the gas increases, this will push it up. Um, so we do this at constant pressure. Okay, so again, that's in the first case, we increase the temperature, and you will find if you increase the temperature, that the volume will also increase by some small amount. So, as I've increased the temperature, that will heat up the gas, and that will push the top of the lid up a bit and increase the volume. So I've got the gas, but it's expanded by a certain amount here. Okay, and therefore we define the volume expansion coefficient in exactly the same way as we define the linear expansion coefficient for solids. volume expansion coefficient, I'm going to give the symbol beta, just going through the Greek letters. It's 1 over the volume times the derivative of the change in volume as you change temperature when you hold the pressure constant. Okay. Um, so I've introduced some notation here which I should define. This is partial differentiation of volume with respect to temperature. I use this notation, a line with a P at the bottom, to indicate that the pressure is held constant. Okay. So as I do the expansion, I keep the force constant, and that keeps the pressure of the gas constant. So if you're not used to that notation, I'll just leave a note. This dA by dB C means the rate of change of A with respect to B when C is constant. Okay. And we will see quite a lot of notation like this in this class, so it's good to make sure you understand it. Okay, and I can give some examples for this as well. Uh, as I said, this can be applied to solids, but it can also be applied to liquids and gases. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of a solid, for example, glass. The volume expansion is around 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5 per change of degree. And a liquid, ethanol, alcohol in other words, is about 7.5 times 10 to the minus 4 per degree C. Uh, 
Um, so notice that the liquid, ethanol, is much higher, a much higher volume expansion coefficient than the glass. Right? This is minus 5, this is minus 4. So this one is about 30 times bigger. And this is a general rule. The expansion of liquids as you change temperature is much more significant than the expansion of solids. Liquids will expand much more rapidly with temperature than solids will, generally. And that's quite important because to explain the functioning of this thermometer, which I showed you last time. Okay. So in a minute, I'm going to explain how this works. Okay. Um, before we do that, there's one more effect of temperature which I want to describe to you now. And instead of looking at a change in volume, I'm going to look what happens if you fix the volume constant and then see how the pressure changes. And I briefly talked about this in the introduction. There's something for gases known as Amonton's law. This is for gases. So in this case, we fix the volume constant. So I make a box which cannot change in size. There's a gas. <coughs> it's at volume V. T, but the volume is fixed. Okay. And what you do instead is you measure how does the pressure change as I change the temperature. So that's the kind of experiment you do to test this law. And if you do that, you find um, two things. The first is that the change in pressure as a function of temperature is almost a constant. So in other words, the change in pressure as a function of temperature, and I can use this notation I introduced, change in pressure as a function of temperature when the volume is constant, this is approximately constant i.e. independent of temperature for all gases. Okay. Simply what that means then is if I were to do a graph of P against T, I would get a straight line. Okay. Straight line has got a constant gradient. That's what the first part of the law says. Um, the second part of the law says the relative change in pressure um, okay, so sorry, I should again be consistent in notation this change in pressure at constant volume this is um, independent of the gas used. So what I mean here is if I take different samples of different gases 
they can give me different pressures at different temperatures. But if I work out the relative change in pressure for different gases, it's always the same. For example, if you take a gas and you heat it from zero to zero degrees C to 100 degrees C, the pressure always increases by about a third. So you get approximately 30% increase in the pressure, regardless of what gas you use. If you use nitrogen, if you use oxygen or helium, you always get the same relative change in pressure. Okay. And these two points will be important shortly. Okay, so now I've defined, described three ways in which temp the changes in temperature can affect the changes in the properties of a substance. Firstly, a metal can expand linearly. Then a substance, the volume of a substance can expand at constant pressure. And finally, for a gas, if you keep the volume constant, then you can describe how does the pressure change as a function of temperature. And now I want to show how we can use each of these three things to measure temperature. And a temperature measuring device is called a thermometer. So the first one I want to dis describe uses this linear expansion effect, and this is what's known as a bimetal strip. So you'll remember I gave you the values of expansion for two metals, which were brass and steel, and brass expands more than steel does, about twice as much as steel does. So what you do is you get a long, thin strip of brass, and you glue it to a long, thin strip of steel. Okay, so this is brass, and this is steel. It doesn't have to be those two metals. You can use any metal you like, but they need to have different expansion coefficients. And suppose we glue them together at a certain temperature, T, so that this thing is nice and straight. So then you ask, well, what happens if I heat it up? If you heat it up, then both metals will expand. But the brass tries to expand nearly twice as much as the steel does. So this will expand more than this. And as a result, this strip of metal will curve downwards. So if I draw it at temperature, a new temperature, say T prime, which is more than T, then I've got these two strips of metal. The brass will expand more, the steel will expand less, and this will cause the metal to curve like this. So the metal is curved. The strip is curved. Okay, well, what happens if instead of increasing the temperature, we reduce the temperature? Well, then the strip curves the other way. Okay. So at lower temperatures, it will curve up like this. At higher temperatures, it will curve down like this. By measuring how much it's curved, you can measure the temperature. Okay. So the curvature of the strip measures temperature. And this is a real device which was in quite common usage until 10 years or so ago. And it w was commonly used in thermostats. The thermostat is the device in a house or an office or something, which controls the temperature. So you can set it that if the temperature goes above 25 degrees, then the air conditioning comes on, or something like that. Okay. And such devices, thermostats, used to be controlled by these bimetal strips, although more recently new technology is more commonly used. Okay. okay. 
So the next way of measuring temperature I'm going to talk about is actually that thermometer which I brought in as an example last time. This is the Galilean thermometer. Which was not invented by Galileo, but it's just named after him, by the way. Um, so, you saw it last time, and hopefully you can see it there again. So, this looks like this. You've got a long tube, something like this. Okay. The top of the tube is empty, and this is just a vacuum, so there's no air or anything in there. All of the air has been pumped out. And within this tube, you have a certain number of balls. Some of them float, and some of them sink. So this, I've already told you, this thermometer relies upon the volume expansion. And you measure the temperature by seeing how many of these balls are floating and how many are sinking. So what determines whether a ball will float or sink? Well, it will float if the density of the ball is less than the density of the liquid. And it will sink if the density of the ball is greater than the density of the liquid. So it's the change in density which determines whether the balls will float or sink. So in here we've got some liquid, which I think is ethanol, which is why I got that data for you there. But this is some density, rho, which depends upon temperature. Okay. Um, so that's the density of the liquid. The balls also have certain densities, which are called rho 1, rho 2. row 3, row 4, row 5. Okay. So you've got the liquid density. Thing, then you've got these glass balls. Density. And this one is the lightest. Okay. So row 1 is less than row 2, is less than row 3, and so on. So they get heavier and heavier, denser and denser for each ball. Now hopefully you can see where we're going with this. What happens when you change the temperature? When you change the temperature, these things will expand. But from the data I gave you, glass will expand much less than the liquid. Okay? So we can more or less ignore the expansion of glass treat the densities of the balls as constants, but look what happens to the density of the liquid. Okay. If I heat it up, then the liquid will expand. That means its density will go down. Right? If the liquid density goes down, then it means that more balls will sink. Okay. Because the balls will become heavier than the liquid and they will sink. So if the temperature goes up, it expands density goes down and more of the balls sink. If the temperature goes down, then the liquid will contract, the liquid will get denser, and therefore more of the balls will float. So let me write that. And, and therefore by counting how many balls are floating and sinking, you can measure the temperature. Okay. So the density of the balls is approximately constant. Because as I said, it's about 30 times, it, the change is about 30 times less than the change in the liquid. Okay. As, so as T goes up, oh no, okay, before I do that, just to make it completely clear, the ball will float. if it is less dense than the liquid. So it will float if rho i is less than rho. And it will sink, it will go down, if rho i is greater than rho. Okay. 
So I've explained what happens, but let me just write it. As the temperature increases, the liquid expands. Okay. Therefore, the density goes down. And if I reduce the density of the liquid, therefore more balls will sink. So I can draw two diagrams quickly then. If I suppose that I'm at high temperature then, then all of the balls will sink to the bottom like this. And if we're at low temperature, then all of the balls will float to the top like this. Um, so finally, I'm going to describe how you can measure temperature using this gas law, the change in the pressure of a gas constant volume, and this is probably the most important example because it was for a long time the most accurate way of measuring temperature available, um, and it led to some developments in the theory of thermodynamics which I'll talk about at the end. Okay, so this is called the constant volume gas thermometer. It's slightly more, com well, it's rather more complicated than the two examples of thermometers that I've already shown you. So let me try and draw it. I've got a jug which contains whatever thing it is I want to measure. This I'll just call the sample. It can be a liquid or whatever. This is the thing I want to measure the temperature of. Okay. Now inside this, you have the, the thermometer, which consists of a ball which is filled of gas, a particular kind of gas. And this is connected by a curved tube, which goes something like this. There's a U-bend, it's called. It goes down like this, and it goes up like this. And you want to hold the gas at constant temperature, uh, sorry, at constant volume. So there's some mark on the tube which tells you where the gas should come up to. And you fill the rest of the tube with a liquid. So this is some liquid, and in almost all cases, it's mercury. Mercury is used because it's very heavy, and therefore you don't have to use very much of it. So what happens? Well, let's suppose that I increase the temperature of the sample. If you increase the temperature of the sample, then the gas will expand. If the gas expands, then it will push the liquid out, right? Pushes the liquid out. But you want to keep the volume constant, so what you do is you pour in more liquid. You pour in more liquid until the gas goes back to its original size. So you heat it up, the gas expands, you then pour in more liquid until the gas goes back to the same size. So you see that the way you measure temperature is how much liquid do you have to use. The higher temperature is, the higher the pressure of the gas is, and the more mercury you have to put in to balance the pressure of the gas. So the hotter it is, the more liquid you have to put in here to push the gas back down. Now the fact that for a gas the 
change in pressure is proportional to the change in temperature means that this can be quite an accurate way of measuring temperature. So if I call the mass of extra mercury I have to use here above the level of the gas there, M H G. H G is the symbol for mercury, right? The, the chemical symbol for mercury. Then we can write down some equations for this. The, in order for this gas to stay at a fixed volume, the pressure of the gas trying to push out must be the same as the pressure pushing the gas back in. So the pressure of the gas pushing out must equal the pressure of the mercury in the atmosphere putting the gas back in. Okay, so the pressure of the gas equal to the pressure of the atmosphere plus the mercury. The atmosphere itself is pushing on the gas, but what we're really interested in is the mercury, which adds an additional pressure to the gas. So therefore, if the pressure changes, the pressure of the gas changes, then in order to equalize it again, the pressure from the mercury must also change. And the pressure of the mercury is proportional to the mass of the mercury. The more mass there is, the more pressure there is. It's proportional. So therefore, the change in pressure of the gas is proportional to the change in mass of the mercury. But we already know this Amontons law tells you that the change in the pressure of the gas is proportional to the change in the temperature of the gas. Okay. It said it's a straight line. Change in pressure is proportional to change in, well, varies linearly with change in temperature. Yeah, no, okay, that's right. It's proportional to the change in temperature. And putting these two things together, you see that therefore the change in temperature is directly proportional to the change in the mass of the mercury. So by measuring the change of the mass of the mercury, you can determine directly in a linear relationship the change in the temperature of the gas.